Well, thank you all very much for coming to our forum, which, you know, we, we do this several times a year. And um, uh, tonight my job here is to introduce the moderator facilitator, uh, Dr. Paul Callahan. He was, uh, he was appointed by the Secretary of Commerce to be a council member from Guam. Paul is a retired economist professor from the University of Guam. <laughs> and then we decided to, that Paul should be the chairman of our Scientific and Statistical Committee. And he, he has been that chairman until a year ago. So Paul, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kitty, for that auspicious introduction. I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, and aloha, and welcome to the Fisheries and Fishermen's Forum. The topic of tonight's forum is I fish, you fish, what's the beef? Debunking fishery myths. You know, uh, this theme arises out of the fact that sometimes fishermen who use certain gear types and certain methods point finger at other fishermen who use different types of gear and different methods. Nowadays, fishermen face enough difficulties from outside their house. There's no reason to make more trouble within the house. So it's our hope that this forum will encourage fishermen to better understand each other's fishery and to work together to solve the issues that face all Hawaiian fishermen. <coughs> issues such as changing ocean ecosystems, ocean warming, limitation to the fishing grounds and limitation of access, negative press, increasing regulations from the government. Uh, these issues are common to everybody, so let's get together and work on them. That having been said, it's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Jim Cook. A local boy, Jim was born and raised in Hawaii and received his college education at Arizona State University. On his return to the islands in 1968, he began his involvement in the Hawaii commercial fisheries. Today he is part owner of Pacific Ocean Producers Fishing and Marine, Nikos at Pier 38, and the Hawaiian Ice, as well as six longliner vessels. Jim is a former member of the Western Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Council, having served nine years, two of which he served as chair. Jim will speak tonight on the longline fishing industry. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I think everybody is interested in the longline fishery and the, the truth and the myth. Here's the truth. In the Hawaii longline fishery, there is more known about this fishery than maybe any other fishery on earth. We are studied, observed, documented to a degree that I think no other fishery in the United States is. So for example, it's a matter of convenience that all of the fish that are landed in this fishery are landed at a single place, measured at a single place, weighed at a single place, sold at a single place, and recorded there. And all of that information is shared with the federal government who records it. So if you would like to know what we catch, what we bring in, what it weighs, how big it is, what the size, it's there huge amount of information. In the tuna fishery in Hawaii, 20% of the trips that we go have federal monitors on them. If you are in the swordfish fishery in Hawaii, 100% of the trips have federal monitors on them. This is a level of coverage is unprecedented in almost any fishery in the world. So when we talk about myth and we, and we talk about reality, there is no reason to have myth here. This is public information. It's everywhere. You can know everything about what we do at any time. It's available to the general public. So um, if you think I got a place to hide, I'm sorry, I don't. 
We do what we do, it's there, it's out in the public eye. I thought this evening that it might be um, a, a nice idea to sort of take you through a long line trip. I have a little video. It's really a nice video. I'm sorry to interrupt it with my, my, my talk, but I'm going to take you through it. I'm going to stop it at times and just talk a little bit about the fishery and give you an idea of a fishing trip, what's involved, what happens out there, what the money is, how it all works. So if, um, if we could, we could start the video. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, I'm gonna stop right there with the green button. I can stop. Okay, so um, we, we're taking off on a long line trip out of Honolulu. This is a typical Hawaii long liner. It's uh, probably 75, 80 feet. It's leaving town and it's heading out on a long line trip. It's got probably a, a captain and a crew of uh, four people on it. To start out on a trip like this, expenses for a trip, uh, we're looking at $20,000 in fuel, probably $6,000 in bait, $3,000 in ice, $3,000 in groceries. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a sizable financial investment to get going. So here we go with our long line vessel out of Honolulu Harbor, heading out to the fishing grounds. And we're out here now, and we're gonna start by making um, our first set. Typical trip on a boat like this, around 22 days, about 12 of them are fishing days. And here we go, we drop off a radio buoy that helps us locate our gear. You'll see these people setting hooks off the side of the boat. They're going to be setting somewhere around 3,000 hooks a day during this trip. It's gonna take them about six hours to get this gear in the water. And you'll notice that in setting off the side of the boat, you'll look back and, and you'll, well, a little, little behind us here, but you'll see that they uh, set off the side because it avoids catching birds. So here we go, we're starting to wind back our line and you can see some fish come up. This is a big eye tuna, nice size one. But this is typical of the kind of activity that you see. So while this looks like a lot of fish, many fish coming up here, in a typical day of 3,000 hooks on a long liner, we would feel really, 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 really happy if we caught like 35 fish. So it's a very low volume, very high value fishery. In a normal circumstance, a fish like this one that you see coming up here might be worth somewhere around six or seven dollars a pound on the Honolulu auction. So while we catch very few of these fish, they are of very high value. That's a moonfish coming aboard here. Another big eye tuna coming on. So returning back to Honolulu, this boat's coming in. They're offloading the fish right here on Pier 38, the auction. And the fish are going in and they're going to be auctioned on the floor. And you can see them laid out here. And here's the actual auction happening. These aren't long line fish there. Those are Onaga here are long line fish. You notice the prices. Okay, so that was the, the, our, our little uh, fishing adventure from a very, very short, you know, like five minute fishing trip. And um, I have in the back of the room some things that you may be interested in. There's a typical hook bin there. That hook bin that you see back there, you might want to go take a look at it. That's a typical standard hook bin. It has about 500 hooks in it. And any given boat out in the fishery here today, we usually have six, sometimes seven of those bins. We throw anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 hooks a day. It takes us about six hours to get the gear in the water and it takes us about 10 to 12 hours to get the gear back. Um, there is actually a case of long line bait there. Our bait is typically from Taiwan, it could be from Mexico, it could be from Japan. There may be around 110 pieces of bait. So you can see that in a day we use maybe 25 to 30 cases of bait. It's a lot of bait in, in the fishery, and it's all hand baited and all hand thrown. So um, I don't know if I've explained this well enough. I don't know what questions you might have, but I'd certainly be glad to take any of them at this moment. It's an honor and a privilege to introduce our next guest, Frank Farm, who will be speaking on net fishing. 
In 2010, in, in, in a magazine, La Via, the magazine characterized Frank as the best caretaker, someone who has spent his entire life representing fishermen of all types in an effort to make their experience safer, easier, and free from government regulation and excessive government intervention. Frank Farm began fishing in the 1940s and is knowledgeable in trolling, bottom fishing, spear fishing, net fishing, and more, both as a recreational and a commercial fisherman. He is the president of Ali Holokai uh, Dive Club, a former president of the Hawaii Council of Dive Clubs, a former chair of Hawaii's Gillnet Task Force, and a former member of the Western Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Council. Frank was instrumental in deploying Hawaii's first aggregation devices and designing a net and bag system for fishing. After suffering the bends, he worked with others to successfully lobby the legislature for a, a decompression chamber, which opened in Koala Basin in 1983. In 1995, a new hyperbaric chamber opened in Kuakini Hospital, and Frank serves as its director. Welcome, Frank, and thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Seems like I got the controversial subject. And uh, maintenance for a long time, uh, many years ago, was quite controversial. Obviously, uh, for its indiscriminate catching. And uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, it caused a gillnet test force to be formed. I forget when it was now, my dementia is good. Uh, about 1986, I think it was. And <clears throat> that <clears throat> task force came up with a bunch of recommendations. <clears throat> the task force consisted of fishermen biologists and a, a mixed bag of people. And we had some very uh, fiery meetings. Uh, at any rate, uh, we came up and submitted our recommendations to the state of Hawaii. And, and I think it was about four or five years later, uh, we often wondered what happened to the report, but it, it surfaced. And uh, I think they held some hearings, and the state came up with uh, the rules that uh, uh, take care of lay and surround nets. So I'd like to just kind of review what is the current criteria for lay nets and surround nets. And then afterwards, I'll show a couple of uh, slides that uh, show what, what was caught. So I can have, OK, lay nets. Lay nets have many restrictions, actually. You have to look at the registration and identification, the fishing methods. They have prohibited areas. And on Molokai, they have special rules for Molokai. Uh, the nets have to be registered with DLNR. You've got a tag of float and the lead line. And that uh, is tagged with the information such as your name, who you are, what your boat's name, or where you live, that kind of thing, so that they can get you. Uh, Boys, there's two for each net, and you have to have a reflective tape on it because the original mm -hmm. thing that's the prime time is at night time, okay? And unregistered nets are considered to be contraband. The state has the right to seize it and sell it or do whatever, destroy it or whatever they want with that. It's up to the owner of these nets. You've got to report it to sold, stolen, lost, you gave it away or something. In other words, it becomes the last registered owner's responsibility to keep the state currently informed on the net inventory. Lay net, the mesh is two and three, three quarter inches in Oahu, away. You can only have 125 foot net, okay? Seven foot high nets. If you're fishing, you're restricted to one half hour before sunset to one half hour before sunrise. You can lay only one lay net at a time. If it's, you cannot leave it unattended for more than one half hour. The reason I hesitated on there, there was quite a debate 
as to the definition of unattended. You know, whether you have to be physically out there, you can see it from shore, you can be in a boat, watching the floats, etc. But anyhow, I, I wouldn't worry about that unless you got sighted. The set time, oh, you gotta inspect it two hours after the beginning of set, and when you inspect it, you have to release all unwanted species. Everything that's uh, not gonna be usable, hopefully you can help them to revive it and, and let them loose. Set time, time. You have four minutes soak time on the nets on the water, okay? And you cannot take that net out and use it within a 24-hour period. So you limit it. Once you set that 125 foot of net, you use it. That's it until the next day, okay? The depth was limited to 25 feet unless you're a commercial fisherman with a uh, legitimate commercial license. You can go as deep as 80 feet. Fishing 250 of space from another net. So if I set up a net here, and Jim Cook wants to set up a net, we have to have a space of 250 feet between each of us. No multi-panels. Panels. So you have the regular mesh net, you can't have a second mesh, another gilt uh, net panel there. Remove coral before surface. If, if you're caught with any coral on the boat, or when you retrieve the net, or on the net when you bring it to shore, that's the basis for a citation. You cannot, you, of course I said, you can't abandon the net, uh, or even pieces of the net. And that's why all the identification, so that hopefully they can track you down. You can't set the nets in freshwater streams or stream out. Okay, prohibited areas. On the island of Maui, you can't set a lane net within three miles from shore on the entire island of Maui. Oahu is a little different, okay? And if you can remember those names, Kauai Hoa to Keahi Point, Makapo to Wailea, Kaneohe Bay to Sampan Ship Channels, uh, perhaps if you look at this map, it's better explained. Okay, so the south area, uh, of Oahu and then up by Kaneohe and Makapu Point, and you can see Kaneohe Bay there. Thank you. Molokai. They have special rules for the island of Molokai. They can use a 750 foot net versus the 125 on the wall. They're seven feet high, two and three quarter mesh. It still has to be registered with the LNR, and the buoys need to be visible to the naked eye from 1300 feet. And that's because on Molokai they might set it out from shore, but then they, they should be able to see the buoy, uh, you know, big enough or be visible for monitoring. They can set it for 12 hours, and in that 12 hour period they should inspect it at least twice. Okay, so much for certain nets, which was the real controversial net uh, during our time. There is some benefit to those set or lay nets, depending on the expertise of the users when they try to target it. They know of certain runs of fish at certain times, and there is benefit to that. You know, and it, it just comes with the experience of the people and the knowledge of the area that they might be sitting in. On the other side of the coin, people are going to talk about the indiscriminate catches that a lay net would, would catch. Okay, let's go to surround nets. Well, there's different methods that can fall in the category of surround nets. You got the old style hooky lao, what they call it, hui lao nets, where they would set up nets, and with a long length of rope and tea leaf and other things, they would go out in the area and drag it and pull the fish, or not pull, but scare and entice the fish to go into the circle and then they would surround it. And in the old days, they used to drag that net all the way into shore with, with the fish in, in the area. Then you got the fence and magnets. That, that's a, a fence and bag became very popular after the Akalang became available to the fishing community in Hawaii. And as they used Akalans and was able to stay in the water and 
studied the different species of fish, their habitats, and how they stayed in the water column. It was, uh, it was a new technique, and empirically, they developed a fishing method. We refer to it as fence and bank. And then there's a coolie net, uh, more popular. Uh, uh, usually, the spotters from the airplane will, will find the schools of our coolie and, and coordinate with the boat and communicate, and they could go out and they would make a surround or a fence and bank. Net. Catching a coolie can either be done with the lane net method, at which time two and three quarter inches the mess size, where they can gill the akuli in the surround, or if they go on the fence and bag method, the, the, the surround net, the mesh size is two and a half inches, okay? And the bag net is of different cordage, it's a little more uh, larger and softer in size in diameter, where they, <coughs> after they surround the fish, they can guide it in and transfer it into a pocket system, and then separate the pocket from the fence and with a low bag, up the right, with a low bag, they are able to uh, raise the whole quantity of fish in the bag. These type of nets that's back there, if you look on where the nets are, we have two uh, nets that are set up for either lay net, which is the green one that, that's monofilm, and then we've got the other one, and then next to it, with the pinkish color, is actually the pocket or the bag. So you can see the difference in what it comes out to be. Okay, bag on net fishing requires a, less, a, a commercial license if you're doing it with the bag net uh, system. And if sometimes they catch a lot of cool, the school is big. And if you're gonna keep it overnight in, in the surround or in the bag, you can't keep it more than three days. If you go beyond that, you have to let the department know because otherwise you would have uh, spoilage of the fish or something like that. So it's taking care of that. And you let the LNR know, or the more responsible people that are doing this type of fishing, they would either release or take more fish out and take it to the marketplace. This is important because the surround fishery is one that feeds the populace. This is type of fish. Uh, people look at fishermen that do net fishing and they go, whoa, look at all the fish they're catching, or whatever. The, the quantity is uh, sent to the marketplace and spread out to the different markets and the people have an ability to eat these particular species of fish. I have a picture and this shows a, a setup. This is from the back of the boat. There's another boat there and they're gonna make a surround. Uh, we should keep this picture in mind. We'll come back to it. it. It's hard to see from here, but in between the two boats, there's an area that you can see. You should be, maybe we can get the lights there. Ah, much better. Okay. Between the two boats, uh, there's an area where the the fishery, the fish, the surround is, is going to take place. Now we got a better shot of it. You can see where that black circle is. That, that's where the school of fish is, and, and they're going to uh, pick that up. On the sides, you can see the support boats there. There's an underwater shot of what it looks like. Uh, I don't have the, the target thing, but you can see the pocket is the high rise, and the, you can see the other bit, which is the fence net. And you can see the fish in the pocket itself. That's all. Okay. This shows you another shot of the fish in the pocket, and the fence net is being separated from the pocket itself. Here's another one with a different uh, type of fish and a smaller pocket. If you look good, the green button. Okay, press the green button. There we go. This is the pocket here, but you can see on the outskirts the fence line that, that travels on either side of the pocket. 
after they guided the fish in the pocket, they'll close the, the mouth of the pocket and then detach the fence line and tie out the uh, blow bag, we call it, and put air in it and the pocket goes up to the surface where they can now uh, take the fish out and take it out, put it into the fish box in brine uh, so that the quality re remains very good. So you can see here's a coolie being put into the boat itself and getting ready to go to the marketplace. Here's an old shot. And I purposely picked old pictures. Uh, obviously, you can see by my truck what here it might be. But <laughs> <laughs> it shows. And what I'm trying to emphasize here, emphasize here, is the fact that this type of fishery is a target fishery. Look at all the fish in the ducks, all the same. It's a, that's called really awful, those of you that know that. Here's a shot of Vicky. Uh, obviously, that guy didn't spear on them. <laughs> spear. But, but it, again, the, the emphasis is that this fish is caught, it's going to the market, it feeds the populace. If, there's no way that people can catch this much veggie by hook and line and feed the population in the state of Hawaii. So this type of net fishing is not damaging. You're surrounding a target school, uh, you're taking good care of it, and it goes to the market. As you can see, you got the, the veggie and you got a coolie in, in the marketplace so that you know, it, everything. So, I, I, I guess I'm promoting uh, the Saram fishery and the fence and bag fishery as one that's uh, very efficient and you can target the, the, the species that, that you want to go. So what happened? This is a sustainable fishery. If we went back to my old truck picture, you would see that, and, or even the other picture that has the Vicky. Uh, can we go back one slide by any chance? Okay. For those of you who would look closely, some of you might recognize where this is at. It's on the south side of the island of Oahu. But the more important thing, there's my old truck. You can see it's years old. That that Mackey school that was caught, take it to the market in about 12 to 16 or eight month, 18 months later, at the same co-op or the same area that we took that and harvested it, there's another pile there, okay? It's sustainable. It builds up year after year, okay? You might go back one year from now and the size might be small. And, and you know, whoever's running the show would say, oh, looks like there's about four or 600 pounds here. But it's the small size. We'll let it go for another month or two. You come back, and it's bigger. Oh, it's medium. Oh, it's like, like it's about six to 800 pounds. And depending on the marketplace or the competition, what your other friends might do, you say, let's leave it go. And you come back later, and it's now medium to large, and it's 800 pounds. It's the same school, okay? And it's better for the market, it's better for the community, okay? So then you, you can capture. Okay, another point is the diver's flag and the alpha flag for the Coast Guard. And uh, most of you know about the flag. And what I'm promoting here at this point is respect these flags when you see it flying. Because it's not only a, a diver that might be underwater for one reason or the other. It could be an operation where some commercial boat is trying to surround a school of fish, as you saw there, and that's his livelihood. He has an airplane, the cost, he has the ice, the gas, the fuel, etc. the crew. He has the risk of uh, the operation underwater, and he's trying to make a living. So the diver's flag, and I underline it should be at least 200 feet away, and a lot of boats don't do that. And the, the, the verbiage is, remain at a safe distance away. You, you have to stay more than a safe distance away. Can I have the next slide? 
See this picture? That's what I showed you. The circle is where the operation is. And that's the, the divers and the crew. This other circle is one of the support boats. And this is another one. But this is a tour boat. Full speed ahead. He's going to scatter and disrupt the school. And this is why I'm promoting them. You see that diver's flag up? Stay away. Stay more than 200 feet away. Because you don't know what's going on there. And this is somebody's livelihood for these people here, 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 and the guys who grew on the airplane. Okay? Next one. <laughs> and and uh, we'll, you know, for the sake of time, we'll take uh, any questions after this. Thank you. You were excellent. Bless you. Our next speaker is Matt Ross, Matthew Ross, who will speak about aquarium fish collecting. Matthew graduated from the University of Hawaii in 2006 with a degree in marine biology and has been a full-time commercial aquarium fisherman on Oahu for seven years, diving primarily on the South Shore. In 2010, he worked on a project with the Hawaii Division of Aquatic Resources to revise and update the aquarium fish catch reporting system. This new system has been in place since 2012. During the past two years, he and several other aquarium fishermen have been working with the state to enact and, and improve regulations for their fishery. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for being with us. Uh, hello. Um, you said my name is Matt Ross. Um, I'm just going to try to, my presentation, I'm just going to try to explain kind of what goes on in the fishery that we, that we do, um, kind of how it works. I mean, we're kind of lucky as fishermen that we're able to get to the ocean and experience it every day. Um, a lot of people on the mainland are not able to do so. Um, e even some of the people who can go in the ocean, they're not able to go snorkeling and they're not able to go scuba diving, so they're not able to see a lot of what's there. Um, for instance, uh, the potter's angelfish, that's one of, one of our main target species. It lives usually below 40 feet depth. So anyone who can only go snorkeling usually will not see that fish. Or this fish here called the flame wrasse, it's another one of our popular fish. It usually lives in about 100 feet of water in sand. Um, and that's, a, that's an area where people who go scuba diving almost never go. So by catching these fish, we're able to, able to share, this, share this stuff with other people in the world. Um, and basically we do, we do kind of a similar, we have a similar purpose to the tour industry, but we're able to, we're able to show the ocean to a different group of people. The um, reason why we exist is because unlike most freshwater fish, saltwater fish are very hard to breed. Um, they have very complex life cycles, which are very difficult to replicate in captivity. Um, there's a few species that can be bred. Um, clownfish are one. Um, seahorses, so seahorses too, because they, 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 keep, they take care of their eggs until they hatch. Um, or species that are pelagic spawning fish, like most of our reef fish, they just let the eggs off into the water and they don't come back until several months later. Um, so most of the fish are wild caught. Uh, the, in, in today's market, most of, most of those fish come from the West Pacific, uh, namely Philippines and Indonesia. Um, currently, the U.S. aquarium market imports about 10.5 million fish per year, um, which is a lot of fish. Um, the vast majority of those are, like I said, from Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, Hawaii supplies about 400,000 to 500,000 fish a year, which is maybe, it's a little bit, it's not quite representative because some of those fish get exported, but that's about five, four to five percent of what the U.S. imports are. Um, but even though that's a small percentage, we were, were we know, the reason why we're able to exist despite this competition from other countries is because our fish tend to be better. Um, there's basically three places in the, in the developed world where a, a viable aquarium fisheries take place. There's Hawaii, Australia, and Florida. Um, fish from here tend to be much more expensive because, we, because the cost of living is higher, but they tend to be better, better animals. 
Um, we're not able to use destructive fishing practices, um, which do take place in places like the Philippines. Um, our holding facilities are better. Um, and the fishing could be monitored and regulated too. So we, the state can, can keep track of us, make sure that the fishery is in good shape, and uh, they, can, they can stop us from doing destructive things. Um, and all, all this is because the cost of living is higher. Um, in Hawaii, the Aquarium Fishery has been active since 1953. Um, that's when the state, the state created a law that allowed us, to, allowed people to, or allowed the issuance of permits for catching aquarium fish. Um, right now, as far as nearshore fisheries goes, that includes stuff like uh, bottom fish, uh, commercial reef fish, um, lobsters, that kind of thing. We are among the most economically significant fisheries. Um, that's just for the dollar value. Um, However, the number of fish we catch is much smaller than most fisheries. Um, you go to the next one. Um, this, is a shot, this is a slide from two, 2007, that's the latest year I could get, showing the relative value of um, these different inshore fisheries. At that point, um, the Korean fishery was the most significant fishery, and bottom fish was second. Uh, sometimes the bottom fish is worth more than ours, so it kind of goes up and down. But look, as you can see, it's fairly significant. Um, Um, just to give you an idea too, this is a comparison of the number of reef fish caught on Oahu um, from 2008 to 2011. Um, and this is only reef fish, so it doesn't include bottom fish or pelagic fish or anything like that. Um, but you can see the, the, number of, the number of aquarium fish caught is 1 17th of the, num of the number of reef fish caught both by commercial fishermen, um, that's the, the dark blue area, and this is an estimation of the recreational catch from the Hawaii Recreational Fishing Survey. Um, there you go. And if you look at the biomass, it's even greater. Because um, our fish tend to be smaller, the number of reef fish caught by other fisheries is 27 times what our fishery takes. But still, we managed to, manage to make it fair. It manage, it's, it's fairly economically significant, despite the low volume. There um, there's two, basically there's two fisheries in the state. Um, which are very different. Um, the Oahu fishery, in which I work, is a relatively small fishery. Um, right now, I would say there's about a dozen full-time fishermen at this time. Uh, we tend to target a wide variety of different species. So we have some of these fish like the potter's angel, uh, there's some of the butterfly fish, um, it's called a bicolor anthias. But we tend to catch fairly small numbers of a lot of different stuff. Um, it's been, it's the oldest fishery in the state. Uh, we've been, it's, it started in the 50s and it kind of reached its peak in the 1960s and since that time the catch levels have been fairly stable. Um, the other one is the Big Island fishery, um, which takes place almost exclusively in Kona. Um, it's very different. They use much, they use much different fishing techniques and different equipment. Um, and they catch different fish. Uh, they tend to catch large numbers of, a smaller number of fish, um, so especially the yellow tang, which is the vast majority of that fishery. Um, and it's also a lot newer. That fishery's been around since the 1980s and has expanded a fair bit since that time. Um, um, so anyways, just to try, I don't, to try, to try to give you about how the fishery works. Um, and I'd encourage you, if you're curious, uh, we brought some of our collecting equipment at our table in the corner, so you can come check it out. We can try to explain it. Um, but when we're fishing, all the fish have to be caught by hand. Uh, because these fish are going to be uh, for pets, they need to be alive and in good health. So unlike other fisheries, if they, if they get trapped in a net or hooked, those fish will be injured and they're, they're no good to us. So we have to use real specialized equipment. Uh, we, use extreme, we use very small, small eye nets. And the reason for that is because the fish, the fish cannot get gilled. The fish, their nets are designed as barriers, so the fish will swim, the fish will swim through the, will swim into the net and be stopped, but it won't be, it won't be um, entangled. So you have, to, you have to try to be real careful, set up, look where the fish are gonna go, and set up your net in front of that, and when the fish go, go to the net, you gotta scoop them real quick before they figure out what's going on and run the other way. Um, that's not very easy to do. It's the kind of thing where to do it, to do it well enough to make a living usually takes years of practice. Um, and the good thing about this method is that there's practically no bycatch uh, because 
there's no the no fish were killed incidentally it means we only can we only have to take what we need um, anything else we can just let it go before we we, we can let it go while it's in the ocean we don't have to take it um, it's it's very low impact we don't leave any rubbish in the ocean or damage the reef in any way um, so after the fish are caught they cannot be brought straight up to the surface because the fish have lived their entire life at depth and if you bring them up too fast they'll be injured um, so we have to we have to take the fish underwater and we'll place them in specialized buckets so we have one of them over on the table and those are those are kept on a line for decompression. So it, it usually takes, it can take several hours depending how deep the fish is to bring it up. Um, so it, it, can be a, it can be a long day. Um, so when, when we go out for a trip, the first thing we got to do is we got to check with the dealer to see what they want. Because we're not going to catch fish that we don't, have, we don't have a market for, otherwise they're just going to be wasted. So we'll check with the wholesaler, see what he wants, and we got to think, okay, where can we find these fish? Um, We've got to think of all the different kind of fish we've got to find. Where can we go? Um, we, all, we do most of our work with scuba diving. Um, and we usually do yeah, three or four, sometimes five dives, depending where we go. Um, mm -hmm. Usually we'll work from deep water to shallow water because um, fish from deep water will take longer to bring to the surface. So you do your first dive deep, maybe 100 feet. You do your second dive, maybe 60 feet, 70 feet. And the last couple dives can be you know, 30 or 40 feet. And that way, when the fish are ready to be to be brought up, everything will be ready at the same time. Um, that's also because different fish live at different depths. So some fish only live in deep water, some fish only live in shallow water. So it means you can find all the different fish you need using that method. Um, and once that's done, we got to report our catch to the state. You got to report what kind of gear you used, how many hours you're fishing, and exactly what you caught. And that, that, that data goes in on a daily basis. Um, so after we've caught the fish, we deliver them to, to uh, the wholesaler, and these um, these companies they'll hold the fish uh, they'll hold the fish for a few days to make sure that they um, they're healthy and uh, have to empty their digestive systems before they're shipped. Um, that's the way that you can you, then they'll check for like injuries or disease and so on. Uh, for instance, this fish here, this yellow tang. If you look at it closely, there's a parasite on the top fin. On the bottom fin, there's a bite taken out of it. So this fish here is perfectly healthy. If the fish is let go, it will live the rest of its life. But it cannot be sold because at the pet store level, no one wants to buy a fish that looks like it's been beat up. Um, so usually this fish, it wouldn't make it to the store. It would be released in the ocean. But um, that's, that's something we got to check for. Um, usually we're paid immediately when we sell the fish. But if something happens to the fish later, we're, we're responsible for it. So we won't get, we won't get paid for fish that don't, that don't survive to the customer. Um, once the fish are ready to be shipped, they packed in sealed bags like this. Uh, about half the bag is oxygen, half the bag is water. And the pure oxygen is used because it gives enough oxygen for the fish to survive several days on the airplane. Um, according to the air transport regulations, we're required to ship the fish so they can survive a minimum of two days. But typically, we'll pack them for at least a four-day transit in case something happens, like the fish gets stuck. Um, is that the more safety margin you have, the better. Um, so because we take such precautions, the, the quality of fish from Hawaii is very good. Um, like I said, if the fish are not healthy and they don't arrive in good shape, we don't get paid for them. So we've got to try as hard as we can to make sure the fish, the fish are good. Um, at this point, if, if you know what you're doing, we have less than 1% mortality from the time the fish hits our net until it gets to the mainland, which is unheard of. Most places in the world where aquarium fish are caught don't have that record, uh, mostly because they're from poor countries that aren't able to, aren't able to take as much care as we can. Um, um, there's, a, there's a number of rules we have to follow, or we, we choose to follow when we're fishing. Um, that's because the fishery is important to our livelihood. If something happens to the fishery, I mean, we toast, so we've got to make sure to take care of it. Um, critical thing is you only take what you need. You don't go out and just catch a bunch of fish and hope to sell them later. You got to check to make sure, you know, you got to check to make sure this is what the, this is what you need for your order and only take that. Um, you don't want to. You cannot cannot be wasteful because you might need that. You might need those fish later on, so you should leave them in the ocean until you do. Um, you have to be very careful not to damage the reef. Um, the places we fish, we need to preserve the habitat. 
because the habitat is key to keeping the fish population. If the place has healthy coral or like a good amount of rubble like that, that's what the fish will live in. If the, if the coral's broken or the rubble's dispersed, nothing will live there. So we have to make sure to keep it in good shape. Um, See, when, we're, when we are diving, we make sure to rotate our fishing areas. So you see, like we have the whole, the whole coast of Oahu right here. We have to make sure to, to, time our, to time the places we dive based on the weather and based on where we went diving last. Um, personally, I, dive, I, dive, I will dive a spot no more than once a year. So one day I might dive one spot, the next day I'll dive another spot. And we have enough, there's, we have enough grounds that we can do that so the next time we visit the spot, it will be a year later and the fish will be well replenished. Um, it's kind of amazing how much, how much fish can come in. Um, every year is different, but if you, if, you, if you rotate your fishing spots like that, they'll last forever. You'll go back the next year and it's like no one had been there before. Um, and if you don't do that, then you won't, it's, it'll be hard to stay in business. Um, um, when we're diving, we have to be very careful to respect other ocean users. And um, the fact is, we are the fish we're taking are small and pretty and cute. So, if we if we step on other people's toes, like the dive shops or the snorkel tours and stuff, it, that's no good. I and mean, we've got to see those guys on the ocean. We've got to respect them. Um, the, the fact is, there's enough ocean out there that everyone can get along. So, we have a policy of taking only taking fish from places those guys don't guys don't go. And so far, it's worked out. Um, on this island, we've been able to maintain very good relations with the tourist industry, even though in some places that's been hard to do. Um, so if I got time, um, I'd like to go into some of the scientific work that's been done in the fishery. Um, our fishery has been monitored since the 1970s. Uh, the catch reporting system was instituted in 1972, so they have over 30 years of data to show what we've been doing, um, especially in West Hawaii. For the past 15 years, they've been doing extensive in-water surveys to count the fish in their natural habitat. So at, at this time, we're one of the best studied fisheries in the state. Probably the longline fishery is better studied than us, but as far as nearshore near fisheries go, uh, we're pretty good. Um, and so far, the data shows that at the current levels, we're sustainable. Um, and there's a good reason for that. Um, like, th the good news is that our fishing vessels are very inefficient. We cannot go and net an entire area. We cannot catch things with hooks. We cannot spear anything. So we're only limited to fish that happen to live in a place where they can be caught. And if you see our nets, um, that there's a lot of fish that will be in a place that just never can be caught because they live, they live in coral that's too deep. They live in a cave where they cannot be accessed. Um, and it's restricted to limited areas too. Um, because we have to go scuba diving and personally catch the fish, any fish that live in too deep water cannot be caught. Uh, most of our reef fish will live as deep as 400 feet, 500 feet, but we can only catch them in the upper, upper limits of their depth range. Um, due to the weather conditions around the island, we cannot dive the windward side very much. Um, so there's very large refuges where the fish, that the fishery cannot affect. Um, if you look at it, like this blue area, this is the depth contour around Oahu down to 300 feet. That's 285 square miles. Um, this darker blue area is the leeward side of the island. This is pretty generous too because diving around Sandy Beach is kind of hard. Diving up by Sunset Beach is kind of hard. There's a leeward part of the island from 0 to 100 feet, which is a typical diving depth. It's only 93 square miles. So the amount of reef that we're able to affect is about a third of what's there. Um, in West Hawaii, which is a, diff a bit of a different story, there is actually closed zones that are imposed by the state, and 35% of that area is closed to aquarium collecting. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of areas where the fish can never be affected and they'll, they'll keep replenishing. Okay. Um, anyways, just another, a couple other facts. Um, the fish, like studies have shown the fish that Reef fish can disperse long distances. Um, it can go at least 100 miles. Um, there's been a study where they tracked fish dispersal on the Big Island. The fish went you know, 100 miles from where they started. Um, so as you can see, if you look, th these fish will migrate from the inaccessible areas into the places where we can fish. So every year, the, fi the, the places where we actually catch the fish are not necessarily where the fish come from. So there's a lot of areas that will replenish our diving grounds that, that we can't affect. And that's, 
that's part of the reason why we can keep we can keep fishing and the fish the fish numbers remain the same. Um, the other thing is that the mortality rate of these juvenile fish in the wild is very high. Um, this the study there's a study done that showed on the Big Island um, yellow tangs that recruited that dropped on the reef from the time they the, from the time they they settled to the time they became um, they reached maturity, which is about five years old. Only two percent survived. The rest were eaten by predators, and that was a place where that was in a place where no fishing was occurring. So what it means, like if we catch a hundred fish, if we catch a hundred fish when they're babies versus catching a hundred fish when they're adults, that's like fifty times the effect. So because we're catching these fish when they're, they would not too many would survive, it doesn't affect their their total population that much. Um, and we're careful when we're diving, we try to leave the bigger ones alone so they can stay on the reef and breed. And, and so far it's worked. Um, I get a bunch of slides with graphs and stuff later, but I guess my yeah. time's up. So time's up. if you get any questions, you can ask us later. Thank you. <laughs> I think I need some light here. But there we go. Our final guest, our final guest speaker is Makani Christensen, who will speak about scuba spearfishing. Makani graduated from Kamehameha Schools and from the Naval Academy, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in Oceanography. A 10-year veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, Makani was deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan and was awarded the Joint Service Commendation Medal. After leaving the Marine Corps, Makani started uh, Kawe Consulting and Kawe Ad, uh, Adventures. Kawe Consulting provides cultural monitoring services, business relations, uh, strategic planning, cultural advising, and ocean monitoring uh, for clients in Hawaii. Kawe Adventures provides executive level tours. Makani is also a commercial fisherman, a native Hawaiian a uh, fishing practitioner and chair of the Oahu Ahamoku Council, uh, a group of native Hawaiian practitioners who monitor Oahu's resources, culture, and Hawaiian rights. Makani is also uh, a, a member of the S uh, Protected Species Committee of the Western Pacific Regional Fisheries Council uh, and the grandson of William Weidemeyer, whose chronicles of fishing in Hawaii during the early 1900s is a regular column in the Council's Pacific Islands Fisheries News. Makani, sorry you have to be last, but it'll be a good story. And you gotta sit at the table after you're done. Hello. Um, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, you know, why are we here debunking fishing myths? We're here because a lot of times laws and legislation come up and all of a sudden we're having to become politicians, do something that is out of our realm, take ourselves out of our seats that we're comfortable being at and fighting for survival. Not in the ocean, we already do that. This is in the hill. This is in our communities, in the backyards. The reason why I do it is because of what I observed, what I've seen in the ocean, what I've learned from the people that taught me how to commercial fish, spear fish with scuba, ulua fish, throw net, fly fish. The things that I've seen and the things that I see in the newspaper sometimes saying that this is the way it is, it's overfished because of scuba spearfishing. Gets me riled up because, you know, there's, there's no way. I mean, the number of scuba spear fishermen that are actually good at scuba spear fishermen, scuba spear fishing in Hawaii isn't high, it's a small number. And the reason why I get involved is because 
this is a type of spear fishing that is so effective. You can selectively pick what you want if you're allowed to get close enough to them. And I also do it because of the smallest guy on the totem pole. The people that cannot fish anymore. The people that cannot provide food for their families. That's why I am there in the communities educating and informing those individuals what is myth and what is fact. Do you know that recently a lot of controversy on the um, in our community with banning scuba spear fishing in West Hawaii? I asked them how many how many scuba spear fishermen were actually in West Hawaii. According to a paper that was was brought out, I won't mention any names. There was only 16 total out of a 147 mile stretch. Strange how we can ban scuba spear fishing when there's 15 of them. Most of them not selling commercially. But providing for the kupunas that no longer go to the ocean and fish. Providing for families that are in need. Providing for the homeless. That's why I fight. That's why I'm there in the communities. You know, when I came, I was born in Maui, raised on the big island, and I started off my fishing career, actually started in Maui, caught my first Hinalea. I remember it to this day, I think I was like four. It was an awesome day. And I tell you what, the fishing bug just, just got me. Since then, moved, moving to the big island, I was able to joined the Hilo Casting Club. And man, it was awesome. We have meetings every month. You get raffle prizes from Tokonagas. You get to go on camping trips. You get to learn how to spearfish with all these guys, these awesome guys that will teach you things about the ocean that you never ever would possibly in your wildest dreams experience. And the Big Island was plentiful with fish. And then later on, I moved to Oahu, and I was like, you know what, I'll just leave my pole on, uh, on the Big Island, because there's no fish in Oahu. Another myth. And then this guy, he took me under his wing, and he said, hey, Makani, come here. Come with me. Come on my boat. His name was Teddy Williams. This fisherman is, he was mentioned in a Hawaiian magazine by, uh, Bruce Blankenfield, as one of the expert fishermen from Honolulu Bay. That's who I learned from. And this individual learned from other individuals from Molokai, Kauai. Individuals like Ike Turner and a bunch of other individuals. This is a legacy that's passed on from generation to generation. And he took me with him, took me under his wing, and he opened my eyes to what fishing was all about. What was out there. How the fish move. How you can monitor a fish, just like Matt said earlier. We hit one spot at a time. We change our core. Kind of like a cattle rancher changes his fields or harvests his cattle during a year. It's a sustainable fishery. And scuba spear fishing is one of those things that we do to sustain life, to be honest. And he showed me things that made me realize that, you know, you, in fact, you know, I'll, I'll take you to this story. He took me for the first time to this place called uh, Molokai. It's the first time I ever met him in my entire life. And all I wanted to do was fish. I put my line out for the first time, caught a mai mai. Caught a marlin. In the first 30 minutes, I met this guy. Then we caught another mai mai. He said, hey guys, we gotta put the lines in, we're catching too much fish. And we went scuba, fish, scuba spear fishing for the first time. We just stayed on the boat the first couple of tanks. The individual that was diving with Teddy for a while came up with two kole. 
three kole. Not many. And you'd expect somebody that was diving for a while to have more fish. It kind of puts it in your mind to perspective that, hey, it might not be as easy as you think. So finally, I got the word, hey, Makani, get in the water, go check it out. Come with me. So I went, and I tell you what, I went all out. As hard as I could, as many fish as I could spear, I tried my hardest. I thought I was gonna get more than three kole. I got two. Holy mackerel. I had a better time uh, free diving. It's not that easy. You know, after all these years spear fishing with uh, my mentor, Teddy, I still haven't caught as much as he can. Not even close. And it's just one of those things. It takes time, it takes experience. Fish move, they hear your bubbles in the water. I mean, we've played a few videos at a few different community events and you can actually see how the water column is filled with fish, thousands of fish. And as we're coming into view, before we even come into view, you can see all the fish just blasting off into the distance. Kind of looks like going into warp drive where you see all the stars coming past you. That's what it is. You see all the fish just whipping by, whipping by, whipping by. You can't even get close to some of these fish. It's one of those things that you got to see it to believe it. And if you ever have the opportunity, uh, there's a couple of videos on YouTube that will kind of point that out and illustrate it. So, you know, this whole thing with any kind of law, anything that comes out into our, our premise, into our native community, into Hawaii, it affects everybody. And we can't forget those individuals that still eat reef fish, near shore fish. Because if we do, without having the right information in front of you, we're doing an injustice to our people. Think about the people. And you know, if we work together on this, we can make a sustainable fishery without getting too far sidetracked by all the propaganda and myths that go about to create laws. So, I challenge each and every one of you to really look into it before you jump out there and say, and hey, you know what, scuba spear fishing, that's wrong. You guys can stay down longer than anybody else. Try it. It's not as easy as you think. So with that, appreciate your time. Thank you. Mahalo. Right on. Well, that brings to an end our panel, uh, but opens the room for questions. If I could get my panel members back on stage here. All right, uh, the floor is open for questions. Can I see some hands? Come on, guys. There's a question back there. about 70 percent, 65 to 70 percent stays in Hawaii. Around 2 percent goes to Japan. The balance goes to the continental U.S. Good question. Anyone else? Yes. Can I pose that same question to 
Makani, do you want to? What what percentage of the fish stays in Hawaii? For reef what fish? reef fish? Your fisher. Well, I do know that you know you go down to the markets and you see a lot of fish from different areas being imported in. Fish you catch. Fish I catch. Yeah. I don't know if any of them get sold anywhere else. I sell it to the market. Stays yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, there was a seafood festival here uh, a few days ago, and uh, there were some questions that people posed, and uh, a lot of people asked about ciguatera toxin and reef fish and how to avoid it and how to test for it. Can anybody help me with that? You know, I, I, I can uh, help you with that. Uh, we did. Oh, we did a um, um, invasive species spearfishing tournament on the Big Island recently, April 20th, and um, we asked for cigatera kits, and they don't sell them anymore. Um, so just kind of go by feel. If it feels bad, you might get a hit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Basically, there's, there's, they're not selling them, so there's no way to test. So that leaves us as vulnerable as a state. So that's something that we may want to push to get legislation or something to get it enacted again, because a lot of people eat fish. And, you know, if you catch a roy, you should eat it. You know, you shouldn't, wanna, you shouldn't be so worried that you're gonna get sick, you're not gonna be able to walk, you're gonna start sweating. You should be able to eat every fish that you catch out of these waters, because that's what every Hawaiian did back in the day, before the population increased, before new things entered our environment. So what are we gonna do about it? Yes, Paul. Okay. Are there certain species that you found there's certain fish that some locals know that tend to be hot fish, like Roy. Yeah. Are, do you target those species, or do you stay away from them? You know, the I, I tell you what, the, the worst feeling I ever had um, was when we when we did this invasive species tournament. We caught the Roy, and we used it for mulch. I felt bad. I mean, in my heart, it was kind of something I was. I can't explain, I, I always grew up, eat everything you catch. Make sure you use everything you catch. And it, it just didn't add up, it didn't make sense that we are subject to that. Um, I don't usually target Roy, I ate Roy before, because you know what, if you, if you spear it, and this is not during a contest, like, you know, I ate it. I didn't get secretary that time, you know. But, yeah, that's, I don't usually target it. Uh, Frank? Yeah, I, I think a, a comment, and I'm looking around the room to see if anybody's here from aquatic resources, but uh, a while back at the department dealing our aquatic resources kept track of reported cigatera hits for fish that were uh, the di different species, the location, etc. and that was pretty valuable information and for uh, some of the fishermen, uh, if you caught certain repeated high volume reports of cigatory incidents from fish in a certain area, we would avoid it or we would try to be sure it didn't go to the marketplace. You would be surprised what some of the fish are. Uh, the more common ones are things like the coli that he was talking about trying to catch uh, in a certain area. And, and so forth. And uh, Roy is listed uh, as one that might have uh, uh, be suspicious of cigatoxin. Uh, but in certain areas that uh, we know and we feel comfortable about, uh, there's no problem because it's never been reported there. And then depending on the size of that particular Roy is a, another thing uh, that you, you would consider. Uh, it broke my heart once when we were on Kona 
uh, on the big island, and as difficult as it was to catch cool moves, that somebody said that that area had cigatoxin. Ah, we steamed it anyhow, it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Uh, do we have a, it's got, the mic is coming to you, could you just, okay, there you go. Oh, my, um, I have a question for Uncle Frank. There's something that, that I um, saw you speaking about earlier about the cause. Something that I'm familiar with traditionally in our family um, that comes with ancestral memory. Mm -hmm. uh, cause I, I'm familiar with were initiated by traditions for centuries uh, where our, our puna were taught to be able to create a fish house that was done traditionally with with um, pung and I you know that I'm familiar with that in my family having traditions where they they tap 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 on the side of their kanu the ba and they would pung during pumpkin and kalu I mean kalu as something that they feed. Now what what I'm referring to is the rights of a traditional customary practitioner spiritual traditional practitioner that has learned to do palu in ceremony. And that was done traditionally by my family by taking their ba'as and in ceremony feeding the house. And that, that is what I'm familiar about the cause. Now, in that light, in traditions, who makes the, the decisions for um, our traditional customary practitioners spiritually when they do uh, when they do regulations, when they do laws, when they make legislative laws, who is the person that speaks for a traditional spiritual practitioner? If you don't mind asking. Well, I, I I don't think I'm qualified to answer completely your thing, but I know Westpac, for example, the council has incorporated uh, a lot of activities, the hapuas, the everything else. That, goes with it, they have groups on every island that, that, that do it, and that would, I would recommend that as more of a reference point if, if you want to discuss that. I, I don't think I'm qualified to say it. I know what you're speaking of, but there's several types of cause, you see. There's cause that are natural with, with the habitat and the makeup of the, the bottom the, and so forth. And that's what I was referring to when I showed the, that school of Vicky that was caught. And for more than five different instances, we were able to go back at different times and catch from that core or that area. But that was not a core as you're indicating with the spiritual sense. And that was what because of the habitat and how can I put it? If you have an apple tree or an orange tree, okay? You pick all the apples and oranges. Next year you come back, you pick some more apples and oranges. And a lot depends on the, how you fertilize the tree, it depends on the current, the nutrients, and everything in the ocean. That's one type of core. The core you speaking of, and a friend of mine, pure Hawaiian, you know, used to say, when you come, you go. And when we used to catch corner crabs, as an example, in a certain area, and all the undersized or small crabs or the females with eggs, he would say, Take your mark, go over there. Sometimes we travel for miles with that, that load of fish that we're gonna put back in the ocean. And you go back and you take your landmarks, there was before GPS. You take your landmarks and everything else and drop. You do that. There's one or two places I can go near shore on the island of Oahu. That's considered a dead ground if you mean a non-productive core, or non-productive area. It's really a core that was, in your terms, spiritually created. So I, I refer you to Auntie Kitty and Westpac for more. <laughs> <laughs> right, because that's what I'm asking. Who do I speak to in regards to that? Because I really believe that we have been underrepresented when it comes to the voice of a traditional spiritual practitioner. And if you can refer me to that person, Oh, that's easy. Antikiri, stand up. Yeah. Yes. 
There she is back there. And there's the Westpac table. Oh, thank you. Further comments? I, I see a hand up over here. This is actually for Matt. Um, your presentation you showed 2% of the yellow tanks in West Hawaii would reach adulthood. So that means 90% are probably eaten. Do you have, or does anybody have any uh, statistics on how much the Roy eats um, that would affect, you know, not only the yellow tanks, but everything else that's um, eaten by that particular species? Oh uh, yeah, they, they did do a study on roy, roy predation in Kona and actually did an estimate of how much yellow tangs roy in particular eat. Um, and the good news for us is that even with the roy, the yellow tang population has remained stable. So fortunately, they're not they're not affecting the they're not affecting the yellow tang fishery detrimentally enough that it's hurting us. Yeah. Um, but they do eat an awful lot of fish. Um, I believe the estimate was, it was slightly less than what's taken by the fishery, but it, it was substantial. But like I said, even with us fishing, the Roy, the Roy eating the fish, other fish eating the fish, um, the population is still good. Okay, I have a, a couple questions still left over from the seafood festival. Uh, here's another one. Uh, divers take more than they can eat. Leave nothing for the pole and line fishermen. <laughs> you want to take a crack at that? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what? Um, divers, you know, if commercial divers, I'm a commercial diver. Feed a lot of people. I can't eat all the fish that I catch, but all the fish is eaten. And that's that's what I have, and I'm I'm sorry if I caught a couple of fish from the pole di uh, pole guys. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> Thank you. And one more uh, final question from the seafood festival, or it's kind of a statement. Stop gill netting. Period. What do you want to comment on that, Frank? Right. Well, you know, it, it depends on, uh, if you recall the presentation where I showed about lay nets, it really isn't uh, worthwhile for anybody to go out into lay net operations these days with a 125 foot length of net on the island of Oahu with the restriction that you have to monitor it every half hour or so, et cetera, and you have to discard it in, in the unwanted species. Some of the lay gill net, which is what I'm thinking that the question refers to, you know, you've got all kinds of people in this world. A responsible fisherman either doesn't lay gill net, or the responsible lay gill net person will lay a good spot where he somewhat targeted is in, in a certain channel because the whole year or something traditionally goes through there at a certain moon phase or something like that. But like everything else, there, there is gill netters that go out that lack the uh, expertise or the talent or, or whatever you want to call it and, and might leave nets out or something else. You, you can't get it. That's like say you can't speed in, on the highway because the sign says 35, but that doesn't stop people from speeding. It's an educational thing that has to come with time. And I think the state of Hawaii has progressed very much in this direction as far as lay gillnets. This festival question, thank goodness it's not one on the I fish, you fish thing, because it's a myth that there's still a lot of gillnet people out there setting gillnets and not taking care of it. They closed the, the south shore from Hawaii Kai to Diamond Head on lay gill nets. Somebody might put a net out sometime, but that's somebody that's not uh, taking care of the resource or doing it 
without the blessing of the rest of the responsible netters that might be around. So I don't know, you know, this can get almost as bad as Congress was in the last couple of years. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I'd like to see if the panel members have some final comments. I've got a question. Sure. I just want to confirm that uh, lay netting is prohibited in the evening, half hour after sunrise to a half hour, um, after sunset to a half hour before sun, uh, sunrise. Well, you pointed it out, because I was told by a low care officer recently that you can set a gill net at night can't sit for more than four hours. You have to follow all those restrictions. Two hours, you know, checking the net. And and, 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 and that's that's probably correct. I, if you recall what I had on there, I said you would have to set it up between uh, sunset to sunrise, and you would have to monitor it so many hours and everything. That information was taken right out of the regulation from right. the LNR. But you can't set it at night. You, you say you can't? You cannot. Yes, you, you're not supposed to. Right. No. I was told by Go Care that you can. Go well, Care officer. I, I would suggest I that. Confirm that. I would suggest that, that he go read the rates. Yes, <laughs> that's my understanding also. Because where I live, we have a big problem with people coming in at night and setting nets. And when you call Go Care, nobody answers the phone. Well, I. And you know, again, another problem. But it's, you know, it's no, I, I hear you, and, and that's, that's the way the regulation is spelled out. This is why, in my earlier first statement here, it isn't worthwhile for a lot of people to set up a, a lay gill net due to the restriction on the time, due to the length of the net that you can use, due to monitoring that you got to do on it. Okay? And so it just doesn't make sense. Now, if you want to talk surround it on a targeted species and so forth, hardly any bypatch. You know, I know this isn't lay net, but if you, even the people that use lay net that target uh, a coolie set, the school is spotted, it's surrounded, and they might choose, even because of the numbers or the size of the fish, to use a gill net or a lay net and gill the fish. But that's all. They got the school trapped already in the surround. And they're just going to kill it. Conversely, if the school is large enough and of decent size, then they may choose to go fence and bag. It's surrounded already. They attach the fence, guide it in, detach the fence, blow bag up, scoop it out like you saw in that picture, right from there into the brine, ice water, quality fish, down to the market feeding the population. Jim Cook, you got any last words of wisdom? I, I was hoping this wouldn't be my last words. <laughs> <laughs> you, you always have to worry at this age, but um, no, He's my not. last words of wisdom is I'm going to get up from this table and remain in this room. Anybody would like to talk to me about long line fishing on here? Makani? Yeah, we'll get we'll get you in just a sec, Makani. Um, the other day I was thrown a out in Hawaii, guy, and you know I I I throw net a lot, um, not always catching a fish. I you know I, I threw net for twelve hours that day. You know how much fish I caught? Two vecchi. I was going for an oil. <laughs> oh my goodness! But um, it takes a lot of time. It, fishing is not easy at all. It takes a lot of, you, you have to want to do it more than anything else. You gotta love it. You have to have a passion for it. And when I was throwing that in the other day, I seen a family of 15 down at the beach and they were harvesting sea cucumbers. Now, in old Hawaiian days, when the Hawaiians harvested sea cucumbers, it was during a time of famine last resort. I gave them my two back in. But it kind of it kind of hit here in my heart because this family's down there trying to feed their families. Now imagine if this family had a lay net and was allowed to lay net in that area. 
probably be able to feed their families a lot faster. Just putting that out there for you to think about and ponder, because this is happening today. That's all I have. Matt, Matthew? Oh, um, I just like to say, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, like you said, we're over in the corner trying to talk to us. Um, and most, of it, most of us that fish, we do it because we, we love the ocean. Um, you know, they talk about busting fishing myths and so on. It, it kind of hurts sometimes when you get people spreading the myths. It's like, they say you're doing, you're just greedy, you're just taking everything. Um, and it's not really the case. Um, all, all kind of fishermen you'll see, they do it because it's in their heart. Um, we we want to take care of the resource just as much as everyone else. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Like I said, thanks for listening to us, and hopefully, we'll talk to some of you later. Uh, I, I promised this lady she could have the last question, and so I have to stick to that. But I'd like to also say that after we do this question, uh, our night is. Uh, is over and there's plenty of food left and you're, you're make yourself at home and talk to these guys they're going to stay here oh more prizes whoa okay go ahead um, I, i've been a cultural monitor on the rail and we deal with the ais worked on the projects until it was finished and now i'm returning to the sea because i've been at this console and fighting the console fighting Westpac um, for our Native Hawaiian rights for since the 70s, actually. Used to be a fisherwoman on Kauai, was the only one with a Yotsuda sampan, bright pink. Her name was Pinkio. And we used to go out into the mile zone, so we lost that when they closed the fisheries. Then I moved back to Oahu, started laying net. 90% of the net fishermen that I fish with for nine generations of our family follow the rules. We follow the kapus. We know where the koas are. We are Native Hawaiians. We are Hawaii. Here's the myth. The United States has moved in on us. They've imposed their federal government rules. They've imposed the Jones Act on us. They've imposed too many rules that do not belong in this Pacific Island called Hawaii. There was no annexation. That is the myth. So when we return our kingdom, which we are working for right now, to the international courts, and when that kingdom comes back, DLNR will be our, in, our interior <coughs> department. You're probably going to be the ambassador. <laughs> you wouldn't want me. <laughs> yes, we follow the rules, but 90%, of, like I say, of the net fishermen were Native Hawaiian. They were working on the Ahu Moku program. Near night fishing, because I like my redfish that want to come out at me. And yes, I break the law. I admit it. I plant taro too. I admit it. And that is my culture, not yours. So we welcome you to the Aina. Use it well, protect it, but leave the natives alone. Aloha. Thank you for that comment. Uh, official part of the meeting is adjourned and uh, make yourself at home and and there's tables around here with plenty of magazines left for you so grab some thank you yeah, I never get it. <laughs>